Shalom. We are continuing in the Gospel according to John, investigating the Hebraic background. We are in chapter 20. The first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and saw the stone taken away from the sepulchre. And then she ran and came to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Yeshua loved, and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. So the first day of the week starts at sundown on Sabbath. It's still Saturday night. It's dark before the sun has risen on Sunday. Continuing in verse 6. Then came Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and saw the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. But Mary stood without the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped and looked into the sepulchre, and saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Yeshua had lain. So this word napkin is a, an unfortunate word for translation. Napkins, as we think of them, did not come into existence until perhaps even after the Middle Ages, 17th or 18th century as having a cloth to wipe your face and hands on while you're eating. There is a myth that the lord of the house would fold the napkin and put it next to his plate at the end of the meal to indicate that he was returning and this is the folded napkin here in the tomb. I'm sorry, that's just simply not true. The word there in, in Greek is sudarian and it means a sweat cloth, a sweat band that was around his head. Now the picture that Mary sees of the two angels is reflected in the Ark of the Covenant as we read in Exodus 25. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of beaten work shall you make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub at the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubim be. Continuing in John verse 13. And they say unto her, Woman, why do you weep? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said thus, she turned herself back, and saw Yeshua standing, and did not know that it was Yeshua. Yeshua said unto her, Woman, why do you weep? Whom do you seek? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Yeshua said unto her, Miriam, Mary. She turned herself, and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Yeshua said unto her, Do not touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Yeshua, of course, is the gardener. He's the builder of the garden in Eden. Rabboni is an Aramaic term that would be comparable to our English word rabbi. Continuing in verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Yeshua and stood in the midst, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Yeshua to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them, and said unto them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whosesoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosesoever you retain, they are retained. 
So the greeting is still the same in the Middle East. Shalom Aleichem, peace be upon you. Shalom Aleichem in uh, Arabic. They still use the same greeting. Just as God breathed life into Adam's nostrils, so he breathes the Holy Spirit into them. Now some people try and connect this authority for forgiving sins to the idea of binding and loosing, which we read about in Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. First of all, this is probably not the best translation. It probably should be whatsoever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. But these terms are about legal authority, about making law or breaking law, changing law. The authority forgive sins is a judicial authority. And this is something entirely new. And we do see that when Yeshua heals a man lowered down on the mat, they accuse him because he should not have that authority. Only God can forgive sin. As we see, starting in Exodus 23, 20, 21, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Even though he is the angel of Jehovah, he does not have the authority to pardon transgression. We see this also in the commentary, in the rabbinical commentary. God means that even though he, that angel, is a celestial creature and therefore divine, he cannot forgive any trespass against him from the Chizkuni, which is in the 13th century. And as to the words, Ki lo for he will not forgive your sin, these words are a warning by God that although he is sending along this angel to protect the Israelites, they must be careful not even to commit unintentional sins, as this angel has no authority to forgive sin. The reason is that the authority to forgive sin is one that God has reserved to himself. As we know from Isaiah 43, 25, it is I, I, who for my own sake, wipe your transgressions away and remember your sin no more. From Rabbeinu Bahia is also the 13th century. So in Yeshua taking this authority as God in the flesh to forgive sin and then also bestowing that authority upon the disciples, he is really changing the order and the concept of judicial order. He also taught the following, Mark 11, 25 to 26. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And again, Luke 23, 34, Then said Yeshua, Father, forgive them, remit their sin, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Continuing in verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Yeshua came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, then came Yeshua, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Shalom Aleichem. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither your finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither your hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. This is where the idiom doubting Thomas comes from. In verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Yeshua said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Yeshua in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So this is John's purpose in writing the book, that you believe. 
Now what we find is that Thomas is looking for an experience. And this is very common in many religious practices. There may be singing or dancing or howling to bring the people to a certain level of experience. And this takes place in Christian churches also. We see that the rabbinical commentary shows something else, something that agrees with what Yeshua said. The proselyte, however, is dearer to God than was Israel when it was gathered together at Sinai, because Israel would not have received the law of God without the miracles of its revelation. Whereas the proselyte, without seeing a single miracle, has consecrated himself to God and accepted the kingdom of heaven. Until next time, Tasimita Inayim Al Hashemayim. Keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.